So, um, we looked, let's look at a uh, linear programming problem. Okay, so it's on the, the sheet that I gave you. So it says, uh, an investor has decided to invest a total of $50,000 So total is uh, 50,000 and uh, among three investment opportunities. Uh, so it's saving certificates, let's denote them by C, Muni municipal bonds, let's denote them by B, and stocks, we denote them by S. And the return on each investment is 7% 7, 7 for the certificates, 9% uh, on bonds, and 14% on stocks. I wish I knew where this example comes from because I'd love to invest some money myself uh, like that, but not a fat chance. Okay, so um, she would like to maximize her yearly return. So maximize return on investment, but uh, she would she wants to invest a minimum of 10,000 in bonds, right? So the, if we denote by B, not the bonds by all, but also the amount of money invested in bonds, then B should be bigger or equal than uh, 10,000. Okay. Then... Um, investment in stocks should not exceed the combined investment in bonds and saving certificates. So amount invested in stocks should be smaller or equal than the amount in bonds plus uh, certificates. Okay. Uh, and finally, she should invest between 5,000 and 15,000 in saving certificates. So saving certificates should be uh, uh, between larger than uh, 5,000 and smaller or equal than uh, 15,000. Okay, so you are given the yields of all of these uh, investment options and you want to maximize return. Uh, so a question, if savings has the highest yield, why would you bother with these constraints if you want to maximize return, just invest everything in stocks? Any business people here? Yes. Ah, because of the risk, right? The stocks are the most volatile, and uh, unless you live in America where cities go bankrupt uh, pretty easily, then the city bonds uh, um, are uh, uh, less risky, but they have a lower yield. And finally, certificates. Uh, uh, I think they are guaranteed by U.S. government, uh, and there is still such a thing as U.S. government. Um, uh, so uh, these constraints are used to mitigate the risk, to keep risk at a certain level, right? So you don't want to invest in a risky uh, part of your investment, namely in stocks, more than what you invest in bonds and uh, uh, saving certificates, uh, right? So what is uh, then max return? We have to maximize uh, um, return is uh, uh, 
0 0.07 times uh, certificate amount plus uh, 0 0.09 uh, times the bond amount and uh, uh, plus uh, 0 0.14 in stocks. This is what the objective you want to maximize and now we have to see the constraints. Uh, because we have to maximize something, the constraints have to be linear combinations smaller or equal than a bound, right? But this says bigger or equal than a bound, but if you multiply both sides with minus one, uh, you get that minus b is smaller or equal than minus 10,000. Of course, mathematically, this is just plain silly, right? But you remember, we want to formulate linear programs in a form that software packages expect to see. And software packages accept, expect to see for an optimization for finding max of a function, bounds that are of the form linear combination smaller or equal than a bound. And now this one will translate into S minus B minus C smaller or equal than zero. Uh, and finally, this one translates in S smaller or equal than 15,000. And another one that says minus s smaller or equal than minus 5,000. And of course, uh, the amount of money you invest, even though this is not strictly speaking the case, should be positive, right? Because some people take loans, uh, right, to invest. Uh, in wonderfully safe things like Bitcoin and similar, right? Um, you know, I should tell you, fa uh, how many, seven or eight years ago, a student of mine told me, Alex, buy Bitcoins. <laughs> and it was three and a half dollars, right? And I told him, Carl, you are insane. Only silly computer scientists believe in this phony money. What is it? You do some crypto blah, 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 and suddenly this is worth money. You know, when government issue money, they have economy as backing, right? And lo and behold, this person is now a millionaire, and I'm still stuck here teaching you. <laughs> okay? Um, so, uh, let's see at the... So your software package wants to see a vector of the coefficients on top, so this will be your vector usually denoted by C, uh, um, is uh, uh, 0 0.07, then uh, uh, 0 0.09, and 0 0.14, uh, then you, uh, ah, and of course here we have S bigger or equal than zero, B bigger or equal than zero, and C bigger or equal than zero, right? And then the matrix, what does the matrix look like? Well, uh, here the coefficient in front of C is zero, the coefficient in front of B is minus one, the coefficient in front of S is zero. Here, the, uh, the coefficient in front of C is uh, minus one, in front of B minus one, in front of S is one. Then here, we have only the coefficient in front of S, which is one, and then the same applies to here, which is minus one, and uh, the rest is just tacitly understood. So this is your matrix that uh, uh, the solver expects to see. And finally, the bounds 
matrix, so this is your matrix M, and the bounds matrix is simply matrix of the, on the right hand side, so minus 10,000, and then a zero, and then a 15,000, and then minus 5,000. And lo and behold, you just plug this into the input of your um, linear programming solver, and without much ado, it generates optimal uh, solution. Of course, you have to say whether you are maximizing or minimizing as well. So this is how uh, the degree to which I expect you to understand linear programming, right? I want you to be able, because it's so pervasive out there uh, in economics, as you saw here, or all sorts of logistics, and you saw that also max flow can be formulated as a linear program. So just make sure you understand how to translate problems from English into the language of uh, LP solvers. Okay, so then about this much about linear programming, about string matching, I expect you to understand the two basic algorithms, right? One with hashing and one with the automaton uh, matching. So just make sure you understand <coughs> Um, how they uh, uh, how they operate, right? Uh, so let me give you one example of string matching that is reasonable to assume. So assume that you are given a long string, right? Uh, this is your string and it has a large number of symbols. Say the number of, in your language, the cardinality of the language is, uh, say, D. D many distinct symbols uh, that uh, this string uh, consists of. And your task is to find, to extend this string with the shortest possible string on the right to make it a palindrome, right? How would you solve this problem? How would you concatenate something here to make this string a palindrome, but also to make the, the resulting string as short as possible? What is a trivial way to make this string a palindrome without worrying about the size of that palindrome. Exactly. What you can do is you can just add a, so let's have two, uh, so this is the end, and then you just mirror image it with the, a, uh, the same, but this might be unnecessarily long. So if there is something shorter, right, what can we say about the resulting string, right? Since it has to be a palindrome, this number of symbols on this side uh, have to match in reverse order. So if you read it this way, it, they have to match these symbols in the opposite direction, right? What can you say about the leftover? It's a palindrome, exactly, right? Because this piece matches that piece. And to have it palindrome, it, ha it has to be a palindrome. So the problem reduces on, and in order to make the whole string as short as possible, 
you have to make sure that this palindrome is as large, as long as possible, so that the leftover that you have to put here is as short as possible. So this reduces to the problem given a uh, string, find the longest suffix uh, that is a palindrome, right? Or if you turn, if you reverse the, the string to make it simpler to talk, uh, you want to find an initial, a prefix of the reverse string uh, that is a palindrome. How would you efficiently find uh, the longest substring that is a palindrome using the ideas from the string matching algorithms uh, you've seen? You see, you could try simply, okay, uh, cut it up to here, then check whether this letter is equal to this, this to that, but this ends up if you increase the size to check for all possible prefixes, this results in quadratic procedure. How can you use the tricks that we saw in uh, uh, string matching? Was it, uh, it was, uh, um, I, I, was it uh, the first one? with hashing to help you. How would you use hashing to reduce the computational load? So remember, right, this string should be a match for um, the should be exactly the same because this is in reverse order, right? Should be the same as a suffix here. So how can you use uh, hashing uh, to reduce? What you could do is you can range from one to the whole length, say up to i, efficiently compute a hash function here, and you can range also this way uh, up to i, compute a hash function of this substring, compare the two hash values, and then do brute force checking only if the hash functions, if the hash values match. Now, why is it easy to compute the hash value when you keep adding more elements to the left or to the right? What would be the, um, the formula? So what is, so for example, here, if you are adding one element to the right, and so how would then, and this is say a string A, then how is hash value of A from uh, one to N plus, to say uh, I plus one, uh, uh, related to the hash value of uh, A from 1 to I, right? You just add one extra symbol. So if you see this string as uh, digits in base D, right? All what you have to do is you have to multiply hash value of A from 1 to i by d, right, which will shift it this way, and you, of course, add the a i plus 1, and then you mod it out your large prime number that we used in uh, string matching via hashing, right? And this is obviously, it involves uh, one multiplication, one addition, and one modulus uh, um, operation, right? And similarly, if you are adding a number here, then you will simply add, so in the other case, uh, let's call this uh, 
string b and their reverse, right? So b is equal a red in the opposite uh, uh, dire direction, right? So then hash value of uh, b um, from uh, 1 to i plus 1. Notice we are now indexing this is 1 up to n here, right? Uh, so up to i uh, will be uh, will be what? d to the power uh, i plus 1 times uh, b uh, again, in this, this is a little bit confusing, but uh, I think we understand b i element because indexing is from the right end, right? Plus uh, h of uh, uh, b, uh, sorry, b i plus 1 here, right? Uh, plus h of b from 1 uh, to i and then mod p. And now the only large number is this one, but this can be now simplified by realizing that this is the same as mod uh, p. Uh, so mod p of uh, uh, d times uh, mod uh, P of uh, um, uh, D to the, the uh, D to the M, right? This is equal to mod D to the power I plus one mod P, right? So this keeps the size, this is previously computed, right? And so this guy can be replaced by this. And again, you have a simple expression, uh, recursive expression for the, how to get the hash value of this string. And then you compare hash value of uh, substrings of equal length and those that match, you then do brute force checking. And presumably there will be very few matches if P is, uh, is large. So very basic idea of uh, um, string matching via, uh, via hashing. What else is there? So max flow problems, that's one of the most important topics, right? You have to just look what we've done as a practice and make sure you understand how you translate a problem into max flow problem, right? So here is a problem that, uh, um, uh, like in disaster management, uh, you have an earthquake and uh, uh, you have a bunch of villages that are affected and you are given the number of uh, injured, right? And you have uh, a few hospitals and you are given the uh, capacity of each hospital and the rule is uh, that injured uh, should be sent to a hospital not farther than, say, 10 miles away. You have to see if you can accommodate all injured in the hospitals uh, that respect this rule. How would you solve this problem by max flow? So you have villages, in each village, you know the number of injured people. You have hospitals, and you know the capacity, the number of free beds in each hospital. 
and you have the distances between uh, villages, each village and each hospital, you want to see whether you can accommodate all of the injured uh, in a way that no one, no injured person travels more than, is transported ma more than 10 miles. So how do you do that? Yes? That's right. So first we draw edges between each village and all the hospitals that are within uh, um, 10 miles, uh, right? Now, what do we do next? Yes? Uh, would you make a super source to all of the villages? You make a super source to all of the villages. And what will be the capacities of these lines? The number of, people. the number of injured people, right? So this will be the capacity of each pipe. Um, now, um, let us see. Um, what about the the hospitals, we need a super thing, right? We need a super sink and what is the cap and the capacity of each is equal to uh, the capacity of that hospital. And we can put infinite capacities here if you don't want to uh, limit how many people from each village in each hospital. Now, what algorithm would you, and then you find the max flow, and you see whether the flow equals some total of the capacity of all these pipes, if they are completely saturated, because this would mean that all injured uh, have been placed in hospitals, right? And uh, uh, the flow in each pipe will tell you how many people from each village to send to this uh, hospital. Now, we, we saw that uh, max flow can be solved using linear programming. But would you solve this problem with linear programming or you would use uh, Ford Falkerson? Okay, so first, if you use Ford Fulkerson, you would use always, uh, yeah, I think, was it Edmund Scarp or am I confusing now? Uh, the, the one that is uh, guaranteed to be polynomial, that always does it by shortest paths. But uh, say you have already a uh, linear programming solver, right? And you can simply uh, formulate these uh, as constraints. You simply say how many people go from this village here, that's one variable, how many people to, the, to this hospital here, another variable. Some of that vari these variables have to total to the number of injured and uh, uh, it has to be smaller, each variable smaller than capacity, and then you run a linear solver um, to find the max flow and verify if, it, uh, uh, if, it's, um, uh, if it is, uh, if all the injured. But what's the problem with solving a, a max flow using linear programming that is not applicable, that makes it inapplicable here? Exactly. So max flow, when you do it by linear programming, does not guarantee that it will find an integer solution, but real solution. So you might end up uh, with a solution that says you should send 5.3 people to this hospital, and this kind of is not quite the best way of doing things, shall we say. 
So you see, uh, Ford Fulkerson has this, and of course it's speed up versions, have this wonderful uh, feature that if all the constraints are integer, as they are here, then it produces uh, uh, an integer solution. So, and you saw yesterday uh, that uh, you can solve max flow problems by, sorry, that you can s maximize the capacity of a, a warehouse given the floor plan using max flow by considering rows uh, as vertices and uh, also columns as vertices and then uh, um, solving the corresponding max flow. Okay, so then we come to dynamic programming. What am I expecting you to see so that you do in dynamic uh, programming? Um, maybe some of the problems, uh, that you will have four problems. I don't know why this is so important. Everyone asking me how many problems there will be. There are four problems, and one has, I think, A and B, if I remember it correctly. So maybe one, some of the dynamic programming will be just to identify which algorithm from the lectures you can use, in which case you can simply state how you translate the problem into uh, uh, something that algorithm that we did can solve. Maybe some will be actually, you will re be required to generalize uh, an algorithm that we might have done in one dimension and you have to do it in two or uh, we've done it in two dimensions and you have to do it in three dimensions but the logic behind uh, is identical, right? And uh, uh, all the problems are pretty straightforward. I'm a little bit worried that I made the final too easy. Uh, so, um, so just don't panic and uh, you will be fine. Uh, you know, if you manage to screw it up, then it's really, really... Uh, okay, let me give you another example of dynamic programming uh, which is very useful for you. Uh, it's kind of a bit another trickier one. So you are given an integer n and you have to find in how many distinct ways uh, it can be written as a sum P1 plus P2 plus uh, PK, where, of course, permuting doesn't count as a different way. So you want to see how many ways you can represent N as sum of some number of integers, not necessarily distinct, but as I say, our different permutation is not a different way. Uh, it's not a, a, a new solution. This is an example of DP that can be solved. You see, usually, how did we solve DP? We kind of, if the size of the problem is n, we kind of try to solve problems of smaller size. But this is not always the case. What you can do is you can keep the size the same, but you introduce additional constraints on the solution that allow easy recursion. So in this example, a convenient uh, sub-problem, and this is why it's sometimes it's not called sub-problem because it's really not it's a generalization of this problem, so sometimes this is called a state, right? But I don't like very much this nomenclature because it is kind of sub-problem, generalized uh, generalization of the original problem. Okay, so P um, M, uh, let me remember, 
um, and say uh, M and uh, K will be a number of uh, ways uh, to uh, represent um, uh, N as a sum of at most m numbers uh, each uh, at most uh, k. So here is just asking you the number of ways to represent a number as a sum of integers with no constraints whatsoever. But we now introduce two additional constraints. So number of ways to represent n as a sum of at most m numbers, each of them at most k in size. So this is not a generalization uh, because we keep n fixed, but uh, um, this, this is called the relaxation technique. Why? Because what we really care is p when the number of integers can be n, at most n, and each of them is at most n, right? So this is the only thing that we care about. But instead of just solving that, we will solve for every m and k the problem in which you constrain the number of uh, su uh, su summons, right, to m, and each of them has to be at most k. And then this can be seen as a relaxation of these problems because we maximally increase the number of integers, that, right, and maximally increase their size. But this, require, this allows very simple recursion. How do we recurse? Well, uh, we recurse by, now I'm confused whether I should say exactly, yeah, let's see. So um, P, how do we find P M K, right? Well, we look for the sum, we can argue whether K is reached or not. So this will be number of ways to represent if the solution is not reached, right? Plus the number of ways if the solution is reached, right? Number of ways if the solution is reached, uh, if the solution, uh, sorry, if the bound is reached, uh, this means that at least one of the numbers is equal to k. So we can now use uh, um, only m minus one numbers, but their size still is equal uh, to k, right? But there is a problem here. What do you think? What's the problem? We have to subtract something. So this is number of ways to represent the solution, to represent the number as a sum of m numbers, each of them at most k minus 1. Yeah, the total sum is not n in your second. 
here um, you take out one number, the largest number, right? And for the rest, this is how many ways uh, you can do that. But we double counted. What did we double count? If we use at most m minus 1 and at most k minus 1, so we have to subtract p m minus 1, k minus 1, because they are double counted here. All right. I think this is correct if I'm not mistaken. I haven't thought about this problem in ages, but I think this should be, this should be okay. Anyhow, so this is called relaxation because you add additional constraint that allows simple recursion, and then you relax because all what you care is when the constraints are actually vanishing, namely P and N. This is just to give you uh, an idea of what else can be done using dynamic programming. You remember when we did uh, uh, all, uh, all pairs shortest paths, uh, uh, there we also had the constraint uh, that uh, the intermediate vertices had to belong to a certain subset of all vertices, and then we relaxed, and that's the very same idea. Okay, so... The bottom line is uh, you are not for a bad surprise uh, on the exam. I will keep my office hours as usual and just before, um, uh, just before the final I'll have extra office hours for people who suffer from anxiety disorder. So um, keep for the, the, the way to prepare is to absolutely understand every single screw in all the solutions what has been shown in class, both on the slides that um, Harris used, right, and on, uh, on, for these problems, just make sure you understand every single bit of solution where intervened and as I say, to, for, to do the DP, just specify what sub-problems or states, if you will, are, what is the ordering, in what order you uh, solve them, and finally, what the recursion is. And that's all what you need to do. So, study hard, good luck with the final, and it was really fun teaching you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Much appreciated. Oh, yes. Uh, this reminds me, the school is always troubled by the fact that uh, the response rate for students uh, is so low. For this, my experience, so go do that. And then, uh, once you do that, then you get, uh, then you qualify for a competition, which is, uh, the reward is uh, free lunch from me. The best, the best caption for the photo that I put on the uh, class website that actually some of you somehow snapped, I suspect, last year, and that you have in this secretive Facebook uh, uh, web page. I have to say, Josh read some of your comments, and I told them to my wife, we didn't have such a good laughter for a very long time. Okay, good luck with everything, especially with your future and your jobs. I take it there's, there's no extended lecture today, is there? No, no.